my real name, but uh, Mr. McFeely is the name that I use on television. And that, by the way, in case you don't know Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it's been on public television now for 42 years, and this is our 42nd year, it's still on. But that was our last program that we taped. That was my last delivery to Fred. And about, uh, I guess about a year and a half later, he passed away of stomach cancer. But okay. I knew that this was going to be in the library for a long time, and my little cue to myself that I shook his hand, I didn't do that normally, but I shook his hand, and that was telling me that uh, thank you for these many, many years of being able to work with you and, and bringing positive television to, to young children. So that was our very last that was my last delivery that you saw. By the way, the Mr. Rogers Neighborhood is on uh, online now. You can go online, uh, pbskids.org slash Rogers and see about 30 episodes anytime you want to. So in a way, we're using the, uh, this is new experiences for us because let me, I think I will tell you how we began all this with what we then called a new experience. So I'll be speedy. I'm trying to synthesize uh, 42 years into 15 minutes, so <laughs> it's good stuff. But first of all, Fred Rogers was the real thing. He was genuinely concerned with children, and television was the vehicle to get the his message across. And he could have done it through the, the, uh, Morse code. He could reach that many kids. That was Fred. He wanted to reach children. And being a television star was not his goal. He wanted to get information out to families with very young children. And that's what he did. But I'll back up a little bit how I got involved in all of this and why I'm here today. When I was eight years old, my grandfather took me to see a play. It's called Harvey. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. They made a movie out of it. And there's a road company. And the star of the show was Joe E. Brown. And you may have heard of him. He was a big comedian of the day. And uh, I went to a matinee. And after the matinee, he sat down on the stage and did some spoon tricks, etc., and talked to the audience. I just thought that was wonderful. And I went home, and in my basement, I created that stage and the set and did the entire play. I played all the parts myself. And I was eight years old. So I think it got me started into, into being, wanting to be in, in the media of some way, wanting to take something positive, which that play certainly is, very whimsical, uh, to audiences. And so, fast forwarding a little bit, uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I turned to television. Now, you have to remember, this is all before you were born. In 1954, there was a program on the air, WQED, called the Children's Club. And it was Fred Rogers' first program. And I would watch that. I was a little old out of the age range, but I watched it because then you watched anything. You would actually get up in the morning and watch the test pad. <laughs> because it was wonderful. You know, you're, you're anticipating this, uh, these programs coming on. And I remember watching the test pattern for about 15 minutes, and then the programs would come on. It was a whole different ballgame. We had three stations, and then there was a public television station. By the way, WQED is the first public station in the country, and Fred Rogers helped start it. And he left college. He studied uh, music was his undergraduate, and he, then he went to study theology and child development. And all those disciplines worked together. But he got a job at NBC. He was on the fast track to, uh, to, to be very successful as anything he wanted to do in the early days of television. And he heard that this station, WQD, in 53 was opening, the first one, and he wanted to be a part of it. Because he was home for spring break one year, and he saw what children's television was. He saw that they were stringing together a lot of slapstick comedies and Three Stooges, which are funny in their own right, but not as a steady diet for very young children. And he said, well, we could do better than that. So he left NBC and they said, you're crazy. Leaving NBC, why would you do that? You're on the fast track to be whatever you want to be. He said, no, I want to go back to Pittsburgh and help public television. This was a new experience, public television. We didn't know anything. I wasn't there yet, but Fred started the program with $75 called The Children's Corner. And he wanted to get some positive information out. Well, that evolved into Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood now fast forward again to 1967, and that's when we began the current series that you probably, some of you grew up with. And I thought, well, oh, that's wonderful. And I got the job, and he interviewed me after about 10, 20 people. He said, okay, he hired me, and here I am. I thought, I'll have a job for a year. 
you know, because I'm in Los Angeles. <laughs> I was living in Los Angeles because I came home because I'm from Pittsburgh, and I was in Europe for the for the uh, summer of '67. This is before most of you were born, right? And I came home and I got the job, and I said, "Well, I'll take it for a year." Well, boy, what I learned in that in that year, it was a we did it on black and white. It was two-inch tape. I don't know if you all know what two-inch tape is, and you know electronic editing. If you made a mistake, you wanted to edit, you had to stop. You cut the tape, physically cut the tape, put it together with some sort of an adhesive, and you start up again. That was how you did the. In your end, it was really. Now, if you make a mistake, there's no problem. You know, you can, you know, you can, it's all digitized, and it's what a difference in editing. <laughs> Nevertheless. I think the technical part didn't matter to Fred. He could still be have been doing it in two-inch tape. What he wanted to get across was using this medium that was mainly used to sell cornflakes to help families with young children. That's what he did. I, I wrote down some, some, I've got, this is my 40 years right here. But the one thing that uh, he, he did well, no, fast forward to the very end of his career when he was uh, honored by being inducted into the Television Hall of Fame, which Edward R. Burroughs and then Arthur Godfrey and uh, Walter Kronke, you may know some of these names, Lucy and Desi and Fred Rogers. And he spoke when he was giving his award, and he was speaking to an audience of professionals who wrote for television and the media. And television for young children is the most important. And within the course of his thank you, he said, uh, how do you make goodness attractive? And you know, you can make so-called badness attractive, that gets high ratings, but how do you take television and make it dramatic and make it something that somebody wants to watch? How do you make goodness attractive? Well, I think Fred Rogers made goodness attractive like creating Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. It was really, really taking what was then a media that people were literally showing slaps to comedy to entertain children. And he broke through that. He wanted to take a program that would deal with children's feelings. And boy, what I learned. I learned so much that if you don't remember any of this, but during that first year, we had in the country, there were three assassinations or attempted. They had uh, King, uh, there was another attempted assassination, and then Bobby Kennedy. And up to this point, if you, had you been around, you'd have, it was really, with Kennedy, they're both Kennedys, King, it was really a very tense time in this country. And Fred, who had a mentor, Barbara McFarland, met overnight, and they said, this is, too, we've got to interpret what's happening in this country through television. Uh, let's make a program about the Bobby Kennedy assassination. Now, this is for families of the young kids, and hopefully, the parents would interpret what's going on, but he wanted to address that. And he did. He made a program overnight talking about the word assassination. And basically, um, I'm putting this in a couple of sentences. What he's basically saying is that that man was angry to the, to the child's audience. And, and you don't solve your problems by using a gun and shooting someone. That's basically what he was saying in much better words than that. But that's what he was saying. But television enabled him to do that. He didn't know that he could do that at that point. And here's this wonderful medium that he was able to get that message out. And he had so many letters afterwards saying, uh, thank you for that. It really helped. It was a catalyst for family communications. That's the name of our company, Family Communications. And that's what Fred wanted to do with television. And he certainly, he certainly did. Uh, then, a lot of people think, oh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it's a nice little kitty show. But, oh, the depth to it. And, and he said, and they said, oh, he sugarcoats things, and that's that's the last thing he did. He, uh, we did programs over the years. We did one on divorce. If you can imagine talking about divorce, but he did. We had the most requested, uh, the most requested thing to do is to talk about divorce. Can you help us interpret that for our children, Fred? And then we had one on superheroes, <laughs> and which you know there are a lot of children during this. Time period where Superman was really big and the superheroes, they come and go, but it was really hot in the, the, the 70s. And you read these reports about children tying towels around their neck and thinking they're Superman jump off the roof. And 
we, uh, we, did a, we went to, to Universal Studios and met with the incredible Hulk, you know, Luke Brigno. And showed Luke Brigno getting into his makeup and Bill Bixby explaining it all to us. I don't know if you even know that program. But basically, you know the comic book, right? The incredible Hulk, you know yeah. how he bursts in when he's mad, he gets angry, etc. And Fred used it to talk about angry feelings. He said, you don't hit someone when you're angry. You try to talk it out. You know, that could apply between people or between countries, when you think of it. But the, the, uh, that was another subject. And my favorite was uh, Margaret Hamilton, the, w the Wicked Witch of the West. Everybody was afraid of the monkeys, the flying monkeys. The children would say that, and then the parents would say, I was scared of them. So we had her come on and talk about how she's an actress. This is a young audience. And I'm not a bad person. I, uh, I, I'm an actress, and here's what I do. And she wore the costume, and we demystified that scary part and kept the very much the storytelling part and tried to interpret the world for young children. She's done visits to hospitals, and. He's done, uh, and you can't forget the fun, too. We, have, we made little offers for children, and all of these are still running in some form on the, on the internet. But he wanted to take that television and use it. And, and I know a lot of you are working with the current media. Fred would be so happy to know that all of you are working in, in some form of media. But I think he would say, but try to make goodness attractive. That's what I think he, this sounds a little corny out of context, but basically that's what he was trying to do, is take positive and use this. We, we, we've got such an opportunity to take this, this, this wonderful and, and help families. I, there's another one I wrote down here too, which I think you would think would be, oh, here's a, I have six minutes, so I'll try to be speedy. <laughs> he, um, study at the Arsenal Child Development Center, which, by the way, was a part of Pitt. And when he was there, this was a really a, a, a powerful department. They had Dr. Spock and Eric Erickson. And they were some of his teachers at the time. They were visiting professorships in Pittsburgh. He would go to the Child Development Center at Arsenal, and each week there would be a parent who would come in and show uh, the children what that parent does for a living. You know, it could be a a mechanic or a baker or whatever. Well, there's one parent who was a sculptor, and he came in one day with a big mound of clay, just plopped it in front of the kids that were at a round table, about 12 kids, plopped it and just started to knead it and make a some sort of sculpture. And for the weeks beyond that visit, this the, the art project for those kids just were way above whatever they did earlier on. And Fred always said that, you may have heard the, I think it's a Quaker saying, that attitudes are caught, not taught. And that's what Fred Rogers did. He would show what he loved to do on television to kids. If you love doing something in front of children, as that sculptor did, they'll pick it up, they'll catch it. And that's, I think, Fred's, one of Fred's secrets, to, to, to taking something that he, those children knew, they couldn't articulate it, but the audience knew, and some of you who watched it maybe, knew that Fred Rogers respected children and respected childhood. And this new media then, television, enabled us to get that message out. And the irony to all of that too, here we are standing on this property, which was where all the steel mills were. And here we are talking about the new media and Pittsburgh's making a transition too. And I think, uh, although you know, I missed that sort of the drama of the steel mills, we have to move on. And you all working in the, the media that you're doing is, is we'll see, it's, it's, it's coming. It's right here and, and take it and use it the best way you know how. And that's what Fred did. He would be so happy if some of the kids who grew up with him would take what he used and, and turn it into something positive. And I'm talking about young children. I know there are games that are, are very active and sometimes violent, but older kids understand that younger children need to have the world interpreted for them. That's why he had the neighborhood make believe. The opening word was reality. The neighborhood make believe was pretend and the closing was coming back to reality. Young children don't separate preschoolers, don't separate fantasy and reality. So Fred helped them do that on television. 
And again, it's that new medium that helped us. Uh, I grew up in an era, if you can imagine, and it's hard for me to remember now, but we had movies. Your entertainment was going out to a movie, which I love. I love movies. And you had radio. There was no, no computers. This is when I was very young. And no, uh, no television. So you, you in, in a way, it forced you to use your imagination by listening to radio shows, too. You would, you'd make your own scenery, and you'd make your own stories, in a way. It was a wonderful time. But we're now, again, in wonderful times. We also have, there's a few more things. There's so much here that I want to tell you, but I have two. But, oh, the one thing that I think, and Fred, I think, would agree, that no matter how fancy the media gets, you know, the robots and, and instant uh, replay and all of the iPods, everything, it brings a lot of media to a lot of kids instantaneously. But you can't forget the content. The content is always there. Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, no matter if it's on two-inch tape or if it's on the satellite or some what we haven't thought about, what I think is important is the content. And that's why I'm afraid we tell you to get that new content over to, to families. So if you're creating things for young children and families, learn about children. Fred had a, it was a CMU student who came to Fred after she graduated from uh, CMU, wanted to get a, a television. He said, you know what you should do? She was an English major. Go and learn about children. And she did. She went to Pitt and took the uh, graduate course in child development. Came, he thought, well, I'll I won't see her again. She came back two years later. She still worked for the neighborhood. She learned about children. Learn about your audience. The, the developmental, that's Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. We deal with preschoolers developmentally. As you get older, it's, it's a different audience. And the other thing that uh, Fred always, always said, that you know, no matter if you're doing serious topics, I rattle off a lot of topics that are serious, but you don't forget the fun. You, know, you can talk about seriousness, but don't forget the fun and the whimsy of when you're broadcasting or whatever we're going to call it in the future to children. Now, there's one more thing, one more thing, and uh, then I have a list of things to read you. We'll sum everything up. And I'm 38 seconds, but give me two more minutes. About <laughs> <laughs> as speedy as I, I thought I was. Anyhow, the, the uh, uh, angry feelings. I'll give you an example. Uh, he dealt with uh, anger. and. He, a little boy came to him once and said, this is right out of a child's mouth, so, Mr. Rogers, what do you do with the mad that you feel, that you feel so mad that you could bite? And Fred wrote a song about it, and he talked about using your anger in, in positive ways, if that makes sense. In other words, if, you want to, if uh, you're angry, you don't hit someone, you punch, punch some clay or a punching bag, or you run, or you do something else, you don't hit someone. Now, nothing wrong with anger. She said, it's good to be angry, but it's what you do with that anger that's important. All of these came out in songs. And there's another song called, uh, and this is very, really, I think, groundbreaking in a way. You know, kids hear songs about wishes, wishes this and wishes that. Fred wrote a song called, uh, uh, Scary Mad Wishes Don't Make Things Come True or wishes don't make things come true. There's a lot of children who were mad at their playmates, mad at their parents, I wish you were dead. And then they feel terrible because they, and they have these thoughts. And they think, well, my parents know what I'm thinking. And that's not true. Fred wanted to get across using television, the privacy of self, that you have your own thoughts, and you don't have to tell anybody those thoughts. And I hope we don't come to the day where they, I read somewhere where they, they can, maybe get brain waves and, and, and <laughs> I don't know if I like that, so stay away from that. <laughs> but anyway, but he was really a pioneer and television and the new medium let him do that. He would be so happy to know that you're taking it on uh, to the next level, taking what's here. But remember, do it, try to make good as a crap. One more thing I have, I'm 18 seconds. I just have 10 things to read to you. This sums up Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and I've got 20,000 words to tell you, but I'll sum it up. I wrote them down. I learned these. Wonder about things. Accept people as they are. Look and listen carefully. Ask a lot of questions. Teach by example. Be yourself. Share, play, and love. 
and the last one is feed the fish. <laughs> <laughs> and if I had to choose one on here, if I they said choose one, I would say listen. I think the most important thing you can do for children is listen. Don't read your email or be online while they're talking to you. If you have children, shut the, the TV off, turn the computer off, put your iPod down, sit there and listen to what a child has to say. And I think you'll learn so much. You can watch children playing in a nursery, what they're playing and how they're interacting with each other to find out what might be bothering them. Observe children to play, and I think it'll teach you a, a lot. And I could tell you a lot more, but that my, my time is up. I don't want to take you, but I brought pictures with me. Uh, like some of the pictures, I brought Fred pictures with me. You can have, I can do autographs. We're taking a break, and that's what I'll do. So uh, uh, let's see if I have anything else to say on your <laughs> One more thing, one more thing, OK? He was not afraid of the dark. This is note that the Time Magazine did when he passed away. And people always thought, that's a nice little kitty show. What's he, you know, sweaters and sneakers. You've got to see beyond that. He did so much with the media. Oh, one more thing. Here's the latest. This is, uh, along with being online, we're on iPod. There's an app. Anybody has an iPod? And uh, I'll, uh, here. And, uh, I'll kids. Not downloadable, but I think you can send it. Anyhow, we come from two inch tape that you can't edit to this. <laughs> so, so buy an app. You can go there and you can buy it. Okay, I'm going to buy it up. I'll meet you outside if you want an autograph. And one more thing. One more thing. Uh, another CMU student from the high school, there's a, there's a, a, a speedy delivery documentary out now called uh, Speedy Delivery. And it's a documentary that uh, somebody in the, his name is Paul Germain, and it is in his third year at the Heinz School, he's in LA now, made this documentary called Speedy Delivery, and it's wonderful if you have a chance to see it. You can, you can go to speedydeliverymovie.com, and you can see a lot about it. But his name is Paul Germain, and he spent, uh, oh, about six months with me, following me around, getting my take on my 42 years, or 40 years at the time, of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So, boy, thank you for drawing up on our neighborhood. Thank you.